what? Has there ever been anybody in the history of history who's been converted by a street preacher? I mean, has there <laughs> ever been somebody who walked in and saw some cat on a soapbox with a sign screaming in a microphone, you're all going to hell, and they drop to their knees and go, you know you're absolutely right. <laughs> so run! And you demonstrate the power of God to the Aboriginal people! How's everybody doing? Good. I spent a summer while I'm getting set up here um, as a teenager pretending I was Australian. <laughs> I, uh, a Six Flags theme park near our house I had opened up a dance place and we had season passes and I went and it was like shortly after Crocodile Dundee came out. Uh, and uh, I did it to pick up Sheila's <laughs> and it worked. So, good day. I was a fundamentalist Christian, a sincere Bible-believing Christian for more than 25 years. Uh, But not all of that was spent overly concerned about religion. I grew up in the church. I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Some youth group things on Friday and Saturday. Uh, Not that how often you go to church is any measure of how sincere you are, because there were plenty of other people who were there all those nights who weren't perhaps as sincere as I was. And I wasn't perhaps as sincere as some other people were. As a Southern Baptist in the United States, one of the things that we're kind of, that's drilled into us is that you're never good enough. And so you go out and you live life as a normal human being, and then you have to repent and kind of get right with God. And so you're right with God for a little while, and then you fall off the wagon and you have to go back. So there's this guilt cycle that they exploit. I was convinced that God wanted me to be a preacher and... Evidently so were my parents and some other people in the church, as were some other people in my youth group. And some of them did go on to do that. But I was terrified of public speaking. So uh, that's what I do now. <laughs> and uh, in my teens and 20s, you know, I was, I was really active and in, in, in into it. And then I joined the Navy because I was in love, wanted to get married, was terrified of being a preacher, was... I, So I was convinced through my entire 20s, as I lived life in a predominantly secular way, but still believed, that I was running from God and that eventually it would all catch up with me. Because one of the things that religion is particularly good at is setting up all of these protective barriers so that you have a really hard time truly escaping. And so when I got out of the Navy, I worked in the tech industry for a number of years, lost my job and said, well... This is God punishing me for not doing what he wanted me to do. And so now I'll become a preacher. God, I surrender. I'll do whatever you want. And after about 18 months of uh, prayer and study and talking to ministers and missionaries who I knew, um, I was trying to convince my roommate who was an atheist uh, that he should go to church with me uh, because I didn't want to get to heaven and have God say, why is your best friend who you love like a brother in hell? Why didn't you share? Uh, And it backfired spectacularly. I know. So there are Christians who will claim that I was never a true Christian. Others will say that I didn't understand the Bible. And still others will say that I just took it too seriously or too literally. Evidently, the Bible needs to be taken with a grain of salt. And um, I'll just keep the salt and chuck the book for the most part. Uh, probably should cut down on the salt, too, I would imagine. But. Uh, So we're all familiar with some, I would expect, of some of the strange stories in the Bible that don't make much sense. Talking snakes and donkeys, miraculous wars that are thwarted by chariots of iron, uh, floods that are survived by a single family with a boat that seems to be bigger on the inside than on the out. How did I believe this stuff for so long? There are a few kind of lesser known Bible stories that I'm going to talk about a little bit 
to, to kind of explore this, this subject and, and how I found my way out, what, what didn't click, and why it seems perplexing to me now that more people haven't found their way free of this. There's kind of a strange narrative going on in the Bible. When I was a believer, it always read like a collection of warnings and a collection of guidances uh, to help us live our lives. Stories demonstrating God's love for us, steering us away from harm, and working towards whatever his planned conclusion was going to be. And if it's difficult, it was our fault. If it didn't make sense, it was our fault. And we're limited creatures. God's ways are not our ways. And when I read the Bible today, I have a completely different take. It's like a sad, dark comedy of God's failures, uh, chronicling this inept God as he keeps making plans and they fail and he can't seem to figure out why. You know, he's perfect, or so we're told, but instead of making perfect beings, he makes imperfect beings and seems surprised when they don't behave perfectly. I don't understand that. He creates Adam, and he seems a bit surprised when Adam can't find a suitable partner from amongst all the animals. <laughs> so he creates Eve. And I'm baffled. You know, it wasn't the case that all of the other animals had male and female pairs, and he just didn't think that Adam would need that. Or was it the case that, like, everything was male, and then, hey, oh, maybe I should do that for the animals, too? Why didn't I? Oh, I, I did think of that. It was my master plan. He walks around with them in the garden, speaking, them, speaking to them directly. This idyllic location, and he sets up rules that he has to know they're going to break. And they do. How can you punish someone for gaining the knowledge of good and evil? They couldn't possibly have known it was wrong to disobey before they ate it. If you don't know anything about good and evil, then everything's roughly the equivalent. We've learned that children have to learn right and wrong. Anybody with kids? Do they pop out already knowing exactly what's right? Or are they little sociopaths who want mine, 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 mine? And we, you know. We've learned that children have to learn right and wrong. And we don't hold children accountable in the same way we hold adults accountable. But this God not only punishes his new children... He punishes all of their descendants forever. I mean, talk about overreacting to everything. And he does this for what must necessarily be his mistake. Now, either he planned this, which makes it his fault, or he was too inept to actually see this coming, which makes it his fault. And he doesn't seem to know much about sociology or culture or psychology, child rearing, or much of anything else. It's just plan after plan that fails over and over again. But why did he create anything in the first place? I mean, was he lonely? Does he know what it's like to be lonely? Can you be perfect and know what it's like to be lonely? I would think that would be a detractor. How do you create anything to begin with? Because if, you know, if our big model, Big Bang model is, is correct, then time began then. So if you created time and you exist outside of time and creating is an action and actions take time, then you don't have time to make time. <laughs> what? I guess he figures we're just never going to figure that out, but why create the entire universe if you're going to focus on one little insignificant planet? Was he looking for someone to punish? I mean, is that, is that his thing? Hey, I think I'll just make a bunch of people because I know this is going to roll wrong because I just really feel like kicking some ass. It doesn't make any sense. So after the plan with Adam and Eve fails, he kicks them out. They spread their wickedness around. He decides to reboot the entire world, saving only Noah and his TARDIS-like boat. Surely this will fix it, right? I mean, the first plan failed because he's created imperfect beings, so the second one will surely go well when he saves one family of imperfect beings. Uh, but it fails. I don't, I don't know how I didn't see that coming, but it fails. <laughs> and at this point, we've got a pattern. And you, you, he, you can investigate these things and try to make it look as though he's really trying and that this stuff actually makes sense in some way if you work really hard at it. But then the character of God in the Bible begins to shift a bit. Just a few hundred years after Noah, the population has miraculously exploded to the point where they're constructing a city and a tower. And most of us have heard about the Tower of Babel. And I wonder what you were told about why God destroyed it. When I was a kid, it was about these individuals were arrogant and they were trying to put themselves at God's level and build a tower up to the heavens. And this was prideful, and he needed to keep us down at our level. 
And I just accepted, oh yeah, that makes sense. I mean, he's God, we shouldn't be at his level then. What were they thinking? Why were they so arrogant? Now when I look at it and I hear that particular apologetic, I think, so what? If I'm God and there's a bunch of people who are trying really hard to be like me or reach me, and they can't, we've been to the moon, by the way, so we know that a tower is not going to actually get to God. And I would think that God would know this, so there's really nothing to object to other than thought crime, that you're arrogant. But if, God, if, he, if I were God and they were trying to build a tower, I'd just kind of shrug it off. But he says, you know, oh, look how quaint, uh, silly little humans. Let's, you know, sow some confusion and spread them. Please open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 11. You all brought Bibles, right? <laughs> no? Hmm. I have to take my word for it. Let's see what the Bible actually says about the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And that's where most English-speaking pastors get this idea that they're somehow arrogantly trying to reach heaven. But the Hebrew word used there merely means lofty or high in the sky. So there's nothing about that verse that says they were actually trying to reach God. They just wanted to build a big, tall tower. How dare they? In verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. We don't use build it anymore. That's good. But he came down? Why? There's a lot of this in the Old Testament of God coming down. What's going on down in Sodom? I think I'll go check it out. And yet now we have this idea that God is everywhere all the time, sees everything, knows your inner thoughts, sees you when you masturbate, whatever. Why did he have to come down? But the Lord said in verse 6, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. They are unified, they are uniting together to do something good, and this will allow them to accomplish anything. Well, we can't have that. So God says, go, let us go down there, confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And he scattered them abroad and from thence upon all the face of the earth. And they left off to build the city. His plan, which keeps failing, clearly does not include unity or an encouragement to empower people to accomplish great things. And when his plan starts to fail, he injects chaos and confusion to fix it. But that fails, too, because we have accomplished great things. And the more great things we accomplish, the less he seems to be able to mess with us. He then gives up on making the whole world love him and decides to pick just one group of his favorites. And he makes a deal with Abram. And I'll skip the normal common stories about old women having babies and people being instructed to sacrifice their children. But if you have your Bible, you can open again to Genesis chapter 15. Beginning at verse 8, and this is Abram talking, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know what I shall inherit? And God said to him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a sheep, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, which is chopping them in half, and laid each piece one against each other, but the birds he divided not. Now, there's, this is, I just, in Sydney, I did this a little, little differently, and I was playing God and giving the instructions, because this just seems bizarre to me. Um, so, and we continue to verse 12, and it says, When the sun goes down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. God is talking to Abraham, talking to him, giving him instructions. Hi, how you doing? I need you to go get some animals, chop them in half, and lay them out so that I can talk to you in a dream. Now, why does God communicate this way? Why wouldn't he speak directly to all people is one of my biggest questions. Why does he speak directly to some and then give them instructions on how he can speak to them probably much more clearly in their dreams? And it, why would he sow the confusion amongst all the rest of us that Abraham appeared to be engaged in some sort of blood magic ritual from what Christians and Jews would consider to be pagan sources in order to get a vision if he's already talking to him? 
And, uh, you know, if I stood here tonight and said, hey, I've got a message for you, but I'm not going to tell you. Instead, I want you to perform what appears to be blood magic, and then I'll come to you in a dream and tell you more. You guys would think I was daft. Why? You're t- just tell me. Why is that so hard? And what's this obsession with animal sacrifice and cutting off foreskins? I mean, it's like he's got all these fetishes that he's trying to get. Oh, I really like some foreskins. That's the next thing I need you to do. Oh, and then after you're done with that, make sure all of your family and all of your slaves give me their foreskins too. Because that, forever. Yeah, forever. I think I created them just so I could have them cut off. (laughs) This is how God supposedly communicates. He picks people to be a spokesperson. Moses, or more accurately, Aaron, is the spokesperson for God. Every single prophet is a spokesperson for God. Most of the stories involve picking someone to speak for him, having a plan for them to accomplish, and then when it fails, killing everybody off and picking a new spokesperson. And why not just talk to everybody? If a Damascus Road experience is good enough for Saul, why isn't it good enough for the rest of us? Why is he picking favorites? Why did he ever make the mistake of thinking that communicating via Chinese whispers was a good idea? When the message arrives at the end of the chain, we laugh because as kids, we're taught to realize what a huge mistake this is. But if we had something important to say, I don't think we'd do it that way. We already realize. How is it that the all-knowing creator of the universe doesn't realize that this is a horrible way to communicate information? Why doesn't he also realize that communicating to people and having them write it down once upon a time in languages that change and die off is also one of the stupidest things you could do? If you've got an important message, maybe you should treat it as if it's important. So what excuses did I hear, what excuses did theists hear when they start raising questions about these issues, saying the Bible just doesn't make any sense? Well, first thing you do is you ask others, others in your congregation, and you get a variety of answers. And then you ask ministers, and then you'll ask God. Uh, Because those those are actually the other people and the ministers, they're your first line. You might pray all the time, but if you actually want an answer, you know you're not going to get it. So you talk to the others. These are the people who are wise, who might help you better understand the dreams that God is going to visit upon you. You ask God, you get excuses, you get some pacifying answer. You then keep believing because you're encouraged to believe. Repeat, repent, reinforce, and regurgitate over and over again. God's ways are not our ways. God moves in mysterious ways. God is so much smarter and wiser than us that we can't understand, and God is testing us. When I'd have doubts or confusions about things in the Bible, I was given a number of these explanations, and they're not explanations. They don't give us any new information. They're ways to stop you from continuing to question If something went wrong, it was our fault. If it wasn't clear, it was our fault. If it seemed immoral or stupid, it's because we were just so inferior that we couldn't see how moral and brilliant it actually was. Why did God create us so inferior that we are incapable of understanding his actions and motivations? If you make something and it can't understand you, isn't that your failure? If you make something and it thinks that your perfectly moral actions are moral atrocities. Isn't that a catastrophic failure? If you wrote a computer simulation that would allow you to send messages to the simulated little peoples and meeples that are running around in there, and every time you send them a message, they got it backward, that's a bug. It's not a feature. It's not a good thing. And while, yes, I guess I would delete and start over, which is kind of like roughly wiping out the population of my simulation, uh, it would be my fault, not theirs. Poor little people in my game. (laughs) It's the sort of claim that the village idiot could make. If there was an individual who stood in front of humanity and said things that the overwhelming majority of the best and most educated thinkers viewed as absurd, Would we just accept this person's claim that, oh, all those great thinkers are just too dumb to understand my brilliance? Or would we possibly medicate them to prevent them from doing harm to us? I wasn't stupid any more than anybody else is. We're all stupid about something at some point. The goal, I hope, is to be less stupid. Idiot, moron, foolish, deceived, liar. 
We're all those things all the time. My IQ did not go up when I stopped believing the things that I now view as superstition and failure, the fables. I don't always allow myself to put my theist thinking cap back on and think the exact same way that I used to, but I can a bit, and it helps. And one of the things that helps me to do is have a bit of compassion. Yes, there are horrible con artists within religion. There are people who are using it to exploit others. There are people who clearly know that they don't actually believe what they're saying, but that's not most of them. They're not all mega pastors. Most of them have second jobs. Most of the pastors in the small towns I look at them as victims, and not victims in the saccharine pity sense, but victims in the sense that they are human beings who have fallen prey to a bad idea, and we can help. They don't always know what they actually believe, and they may just believe in belief. In other words, they may not be, may not be convinced of the specific claims that their church are true, but they may be convinced that it's important and valuable for them to proclaim that they believe and then act as if they believe. Pascal understood this when I did a Patreon video about Pascal's wager. Belief is not a choice. You believe something, that means you accept that it's true. You didn't just choose to believe. You do make choices to some extent, but belief is the state of being convinced and you become convinced and you can become convinced for good reasons or bad reasons. And Pascal pointed out that if you don't believe, if you think that you can't believe, you aren't convinced, you should act as if you believe, because belief will come later. Pascal was encouraging intentional self-deception. When I was in Sydney, I took some time out to speak to some street preachers, and uh, that was fun. Um, we got there, and Arne set up shop over on one corner where there was somebody preaching with a megaphone, and uh, I went over to another corner, and I just stood there, and I waited because I know what they're going to do. I don't have to go door to door. People were like, oh, you should come join our forum. Somebody was saying that earlier. You should join our forum if you want an argument. I've been doing this for 10 years on the show and more years before that. I got more than enough arguments. They come, they call me, they email me. I don't ever have to go looking for one. And as I stand in front of the preacher, I know in just a second he's going to walk over to me and want to share uh, his love for Jesus. And I got in the, I had three different conversations. The first one he just kept getting louder. He didn't know the Bible. He tried to make excuses. We talked about slavery because that's my go-to. It's really simple. Is slavery immoral? Oh, yes. Is the Bible the Word of God? Yes. Is God moral? Yes. Then why does he say you can own slaves? Why does he expressly say in Exodus 21, Leviticus either 23 or 25, and then again in De Deuteronomy, that you can enslave your fellow Jews, but you have to let them go after six years unless you trick them by giving them a wife and kids? Why does he say, uh, as far as owning other people other than Jews, they are your property forever. You can buy your slaves from the heathen who surround you, pass them on to your kids. You can beat them as long as they don't die within a day or two. Oh, no, no, that's the Old Testament. Yeah, you know what else is the Old Testament? The Ten Commandments, original sin, all of the prophecies that you want to cite for Jesus. You don't get to just, just chuck out that entire section. So you get into this back and forth. And there reached a point where I don't remember what he was saying, but it was the rough equivalent of no, 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 no. It was like, do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? Do you believe me? Why ask the people who were standing there? I'm sitting there and I just asked simple questions and I kept my voice slightly lower than his. And he got to where that was his response. The second guy I talked to, when we had a similar conversation, blank face. Just stopped talking. I swear to the God I don't believe in that it was like somebody flipped a switch and turned his brain off. <laughs> and he said, you're pretty good at this. Thanks so much for your time. I'm <laughs> There was a third guy who was convinced that the Gospels were actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, would not accept the fact that even, yes, the most knowledgeable Christian scholars recognize that these are names that were put on by the church as a matter of tradition. We don't know who wrote them. We don't have the originals. It didn't make any difference. He was laughing out loud when I suggested that the earth might, in fact, be billions of years old. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And I told him, I'd laugh too. If I had this baggage that you have, if I had this understanding and somebody told me this, it would seem absurd and I would laugh. 
Why is it that they're convinced of these things? In many cases, it's because in addition to believing that there's a magical God governing the universe, they've also been convinced that there's a very powerful evil being trying to deceive them. And they have to be diligent and on guard at all times, cling to their religion and avoid, in order to avoid being deluded. That evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups constructed by the devil. You just have to have a little more faith. You have to trust God because he knows better than us. As if I could trust someone that won't even talk to me in any perceptible way. Yesterday I had a sit down here in Melbourne with uh, an Anglican uh, preacher. I don't know if he's here or not. We'd, I think he had another engagement. Um, and he gave his reasons for believing. I thought I'd go through them. I don't really need to do too much of a response, but I will. Mm. He was raised, so they build this as he was raised an atheist and is now a Christian, and I was raised a Christian and I'm now an atheist. The truth is, we both started as non believers. He got convinced of some garbage. Then we both got convinced of Christianity. Then I figured out that we didn't need to be convinced of this. There was no good reason, and he hasn't figured that out yet. That's the true story. Why did he, why did he become a Christian? Well, he spent a lot of time talking about how he fancied a girl who was Christian, uh, how he met some happy Christians how the girl's father took him out on a beach at night and uh, basically tried to instill in him this idea that his atheist views meant that his life was without value and that he could strangle him right on that beach, chop his body up into little pieces and use it to fertilize his garden, the love of Christ. Uh, <laughs> and and that this was, this was one of the reasons that he was convinced to convert, but there's more than that. He was also convinced because he can't believe that all of this is an accident because he wants there to be an absolute foundation for morality, and because he doesn't like the idea that we start and end as nothing, so the middle must be worth nothing as well. None of those are reasons to believe, even if they were correct. You like a girl who's a... What would happen if you met a Hindu girl or a Buddhist girl or a secular humanist girl? woo -hoo. He met some happy Christians. I've met happy all kinds of people, and happy drunks. There's an old, I'm, I'm stealing somebody else's material there about, about the fact that a drunk person's happy is irrelevant. But yeah, it is. I've met tons of happy secular humanists. They, people have this idea that, oh, you can't have any joy in life from the clip earlier. I get more hugs and more smiles and have more fun. And the thing that's different between, oh, you guys are just like church. No, when I was with church groups, I got hugs and smiles and friends that all left as soon as my views on religion changed, and the activities that we participated in were always somehow wrapped up in the church. With you guys, I go to museums and zoos and science lectures, and none of you have abandoned me just because we might disagree on one little piece of something or another. Uh, the girl's father threatening you, I could see maybe doing a, a maybe a 10 minute conversion just to make sure you could get out of there. Um, <laughs> but you know, when he asks what my life's worth, what's well, worth something to me? And if you kill me, you'll have to live with the fact that I'm morally superior to you. Because I'm not going to kill you. I'm not even going to be mad at you. Or at least not much. <laughs> he can't believe this is all an accident, yet he's fine with the laws of physics in small doses, but tosses them out when we want to try to combine those effects into a chain. It's like saying, yes, I see that the big hand on the watch can move from one minute to the next, but I just can't believe that it makes it all the way around. He wants a moral foundation. I'd say that, right, that reality is the foundation. But the kind of world you want to live in has no bearing on the kind of world you actually do live in. So maybe there is no moral foundation. If you really want some abstract, transcendent, fixed, objective moral standard, cool. Doesn't mean it's there. And it's not a reason to believe. Oh, we begin with nothing, we end with nothing. That means the middle's nothing. Baloney. Does that mean that the meal that I ate has no value because I'm going to have to eat again later? My life has value to me now. It's the now that matters. The now and what's ever coming next. Leave the past behind. And if it turns out there's an afterlife, bonus. And if it out, turns out I'm burning in hell, as the, the other pastor told me today, um, oh well, I can't do anything. I can't do anything to fix it. I could not convince my mind to worship anything, even if I knew it existed, but definitely not something that I found morally repugnant. I'd rather burn and know that I'm better than the person who's burning me. When you appeal to gods to try to solve these questions, 
They may pacify, but that's separate from whether or not it's actually true. Today, there was a street preacher I engaged with who denied science, appealed to faith, acknowledged points, admitted he admitted that faith was unreliable. There's a little tap dance. Adam will post a, I'm probably running long on time, but Adam posted a video uh, or audio of the exchange. It was fun. One of the most honest street preachers I've ever come across. Hey, why do you believe? Oh, I believe because of this. Okay, can you demonstrate that? Well, I can't prove any of that to you. All right. Since you say you can't prove it, do you think it's possible to demonstrate that this is true? No. Why would you believe something before it's been demonstrated to be true? Don't you think it's better to wait and believe it after it's been demonstrated? No. And then he said, you just have to have faith. Okay. But if faith can be used to justify your beliefs and the Hindu beliefs and the Muslim beliefs, is faith a good path to truth? No. (laughs) Don't you care about what's true? Yeah. It, I was taken aback because he, was, he also asked me, he found out I was a magician, and <laughs> he started asking me about the guys on TV, do, is that just tricks or do they actually have supernatural powers? And I was like, <laughs> but I've seen them, they'll, you can't touch that pack of cigarettes and the person can't. How do they do it when they levitate? So I turned around, I levitated, and he was like, it's like I had demons running all through me, and he made me do it again, and then he fig- I showed him kind of how it was done. Uh, I hope that it resonated a bit so that he doesn't buy into every crap thing. But this idea that God is so superior to us that we're, we're just incapable of understanding doesn't make any sense. Telling me that God is so much better that he can see further and knows the goal doesn't solve anything. It's like, it's like walking hand in hand with a giant through a forest. I'll be the giant. He may be able to see where we're going, but meanwhile, my ass is getting smacked around through trees and brush, and it's torture. He can't see my path, doesn't seem to care about my path, or that's at least the impression. Pick me up! If you're so damn smart and can see farther, pick me up. Do you not see what you're doing? I'm better off without you. If we saw somebody being dragged along like that, we'd join forces to try to rescue them. May even go so far as to kill the giant, although I think that'd be a last resort because they're so rare. (laughs) So either pick me up to your level or piss off. I'm trying to make it without losing a limb. There's a lot of talk about tone. Oh, you atheists, you're just so angry. I'm not mad at God or Lord Voldemort. I don't hate believers, or even their public advocates, vomiting the same tired, invalid, and unsound arguments. The people who believe, they're victims. They're victims of merely being human, trusting information that they're given. We all do that. Trying to get through the day-to-day life doesn't often give you the chance to think in a manner conducive to discovering your errors. It's like saying, why didn't I remember that? Why didn't I know that? If you don't know what you don't know, how did you know you didn't know it? You need help from others. It's one of the reasons why we benefit from being a communal species. My anger is reserved for the harmful ideas that these individuals foster and spread like diseases through the minds of humans. If I thought they were stupid, I wouldn't waste my time talking to them. If I thought they were evil or incapable of reasoning, I wouldn't waste my time. Yes, there are people who exploit the flaws in our thinking. Some of them do it for entertainment as magicians. Some of them do it as frauds, as psychics, and faith healers. I can't tell the difference between the person who's intentionally using religion to fool someone and the person who is sincerely using religion to fool someone. David Hume is my favorite philosopher, and there's a number of quotes from him. One of the questions to ask is, Is it more likely that the individual is intending to deceive or has been deceived or that the thing is true? We know the story of the Tower of Babel is false. That isn't the way languages came about, and it's far more reasonable to understand that the story is just an early attempt to explain the diversity of language and culture. That's what's more reasonable. Unity 
good communication, a drive to accomplish great things together. These were the sins of the people of Babel. These were the things that God supposedly just couldn't tolerate. These are the cornerstones of humanism. These are the things we strive for, the things we must strive for if we're to better our world. And we have bettered our world and will continue to. I said in the past that if there's a God and he's not a humanist, fuck him. I think though today I'd say something a little bit different. If there is a God, and I have no reason to think there is one, or care much about God's playing an eternal game of hide and seek, but if he exists and he's not a humanist, I would hope that he's open to being convinced. I would hope that he can see reason. I'd hope that he could bend down and see our path. And I'd hope that he'd be able to understand things as we do. And I hope that he's nothing like the childish, vindictive, inept fool depicted in so many holy books. I hope that he can empathize and help. Because if he's just the oafish giant uncaringly dragging people through the jungle, or an imaginary friend that reflects our own self-loathing and fear, fuck him, we're better off on our own. <laughs>